a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome to the interview room, everybody. What an amazing, amazing night we're going to have uh, this evening. And, you know, there's a couple of somber things that are happening around the world. And, of course, you can see we have Dr. Burgess, Dr. Bricado again tonight. And I'm going to get into their bios here in a minute. But just before we do that, first of all, I want to send our thoughts and our prayers out to the many victims and the survivors of uh, the Maui fires in Maui, Hawaii. Uh, those poor people have been struggling uh, to, you know, find out what in the world happened. And there are a whole bunch of uh, pages you can go to to help support the American Red Cross and a variety of other uh, fundraising pages. So if you can get over there, and of course, one of our mods, uh, Miss Maui Girl, actually lives on the island. So send her uh, the love and support that she uh, needs tonight with her family as well. Fortunately, uh, the, our Maui girl, uh, they were lucky. Both she and her husband were are safe and sound, and uh, they're able to help their community recover uh, because of that. So uh, if you could get over uh, you know, and talk to her a little bit in the chat, I'm sure she'll have some good places to go to help support that. Another uh, thing I want to talk to you tonight about is one of our uh, Brothers in Blue. Uh, my agency in Southern California is a fine officer by the name of Eddie Reyes. If you go up in the link tonight in chat, it is pinned a fundraiser for him. He is suffering from ALS and it is a, just a tough struggle for him. And we're trying to raise some money for him. So I want to ask a special thing tonight. Do not give any type of you know, super chats or anything like that, go up into the link, send that over to Eddie. And then would you please also uh, pass that along the link there? And I, I just want to give you a little insight as to uh, who Eddie is. I'm going to show my screen here for a second. All right. All right. I hope, can everybody see that? I'm sure you can. This is Eddie. Eddie Reyes, and uh, his, the goal here is $75,000, and I know we can hit this. He was uh, born in Houston, Texas, a proud Texas, and, of course, an American patriot. He uh, proudly enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 1993, where he serves with the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force, or MEF, overseas in Okinawa, Japan, and that took him back to Camp Pendleton. Uh, from there, he became a police officer in 2001, and he was hired by our agency. And I'm telling you, this guy is just a solid, solid uh, human being. He uh, served as a member of the SWAT team, the Long Rifle and Defensive Tactics Units. He's excellent in everything that he's did, but more importantly, he's an excellent father, he's an excellent Marine, and he's an excellent officer. And he's fighting right now this horrible disease, ALS. And let me tell you, Karen and I know something about that for sure. Uh, our um, niece also suffers from ALS and our middle daughter uh, suffered from Guillain-Barre, uh, which is a sister to ALS. And so uh, we know that fight. So tonight, 
Can you please share that information about Eddie to everyone in your social networks? We got 178,000 people who subscribe to this channel. We've got almost 1,000 people here already in the chat. So tonight, again, hit the link above that's pinned and get over there if you can. Even if we each gave $5, just $5 for the cause of ALS, that would be an amazing thing. And no money touches hands here. It all goes through PORAC, which is the Peace Officers Research Association of California. So let's help Eddie in his fight if we can. Okay, so tonight, as you can tell, man, or have we been blessed again with Dr. Ann Burgess and Dr. Gary Bracado. If you've not been here on our channel, you are in for an amazing experience with two of the brightest minds, in my opinion, uh, not only in you know the psychiatric, forensic psychiatric world, but Anne is a, literally a legend in her own right. She was one of the very first uh, uh, people, uh, people in the uh, behavior science unit. And let me give you just the short versions of who our guests are. Dr. Ann Burgess, PhD, is a renowned pioneer in the assessment and treatment of victims of trauma and abuse, and is one of the original mine hunters. She is the author of Killer by Design, Murderers, Mine Hunters, and My Quest to Decipher the Criminal Mind. We have links to both her books and Gary's books below. So if you have not had a chance to buy those books yet, uh, get them. Trust me, you will. Uh, make sure your lights are on, though, when you're reading them. Uh, because they are they are gripping and they're just amazing. Uh, among her many awards and accolades in 2016, she was named a um, living legend by the American Academy of Nursing. And we are just so always honored and blessed to have Anne uh, on our show tonight. Thank you for being here, Anne. Thanks, Chris. To the right is Dr. Gary Bracado. Oh my gosh, if you guys have not seen some of his work, well, you, you put your seatbelts on. Uh, first of all, he's not eating all day, and I, get, I told him, would you please get something to eat? And while he was talking to us, his doorbell rang, so uh, I hope he grabs at least something into, into his system. But Dr. Bracado is also a PhD. He's a visiting scholar at Boston College where he collaborates with Dr. Ann Burgess and Dr. Victor Petreka on forensic research. They have examined crimes such as murder, including serial killing, sex offenses, mutilation and dismemberment, and the insanity defense, how that applies. Uh, Dr. Bracado is currently serving as a consultant on a grant-funded project by Dr. Bur uh, Burgess and, and Petreka, Petreka analyzing murders involving asphyxiation by strangulation and other means. So I'm here to tell you guys, when we tie this together with the Hillside Stranglers tonight and the Long Island Killer, we've got the two experts in the world right above me in this studio. He studies, among other things, how violent thoughts and actions emerge in psychotic versus non-psychotic persons. He's the author of the Columbia University, he's the co-author of the Columbia University Mass Murder Database, which is the largest database in the world. And he's the co-author of the new evil, Understanding the Emergence of Modern Violent Crime. We have links to his book as well in the description below. And I know many of you in the chat tonight have already read his uh, books as well as Anne's, uh, but if you've not, again, get in, get into Amazon and get those, get those books in your library. You will not be disappointed. So tonight we're going to discuss the Long Island serial killer Rex Hureman and his obsession with the Los Angeles Hillside Stranglers, Stranglers from the 1970s. And so, how did this come about? Well, Dr. Bracado was just chit-chatting with me and, and Ann, and he says, you know, I know that this guy was obsessed based on some people that he was communicating with, including a date with the Hillside Stranglers. And he says, I'm telling you, 
and this, and I'm just going to quote him here. I'm telling you, this is going to be right on target with the way this guy's thinking. And so with that, we're going to get into who the Hillside Stranglers are first. And then we're going to talk about Rex and how they kind of overlap. But until we do so, let's have a couple of let's opening couple statements of maybe, and we'll start with Dr. Burgess. Uh, and what are your thoughts initially going into this conversation tonight? Well, I think it's fascinating to see the comparison between the two. Uh, that was that that he would have so early because so this early, is back in the 70s early. that he would have a um, a preference if you will or whatever his favorite i guess his, that was his word uh serial killer because we figured out his age he would have been a teenager back in 70 in the late 70s so that starts early although that matches what we have found in the work we did with the interviewing the 36 killers so there's that adolescent period is very very important and also he had had the loss of his father that we uh, talked about back when he was 11 or 12. so all of that certainly makes for some symbolic uh, interesting psychological um, theory awesome I, I can't wait Gary opening statement on it before we get into the PowerPoint well I'll say that one of the things that's really fascinating is hearing from these people that interacted either in a chance way or in a daily way with um, the accused, with Rex. And the picture is rapidly emerging of a person who on the one hand was seen as a kind of a, of a, um, you know, a kind of a, 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 an ordinary guy that people really didn't think could possibly do anything aggressive. But on the other hand, this guy that could explode or hold an incredible grudge. And the most fascinating thing to me have been women coming forward who say that they had perhaps worked as escorts or so forth, who went out on dates with him and who were not ultimately killed because they didn't go home with him uh, or were smart enough to kind of figure out that something was up and slip away. Not to suggest that the other victims were not smart enough. I just mean that they fell prey and, um, what, and and then we start to get these incredible glimpses into these vile things that he would talk about on the date. And I think the idea that he would tell one of them that he had a favorite serial killer, which was the, the Hillside Stranglers duo, I think it, even though it's getting kind of um, hidden in all the other discussion about what went on at the date, to people like Anne and me, that insight is perhaps one of the most important about that he would have been studying the Hillside Stranglers, obsessing over them, idealizing them. And the comparisons between him and Bianchi, which I hope we're going to get into, I mean, they're even on a granular level. You even have to talk about things like that Bianchi lost his father at a very young age and went into total denial of it, which is exactly what I think happened with Hoyermann, right? So that, that we'll have to get into what would have made him gravitate towards these particular guys <laughs> And, um, and how perhaps that's where he started to get the ideas for some of his sexual fantasies and his, uh, his wish of what he'd like to be. Um, so let's sort of hold off on that a little bit. But, but it all comes from that TikTok video that one of these women, you know, these women who survived made. Uh, I have the link to it, which I could provide you, Chris, if you want to circulate it to people. Okay, sounds good, Doc. And what a great segue into tonight's program. So I've just put a couple of slides together. Uh, you know, for the initial conversation here, you know, to talk about Kenneth Bianchi and, of course, his cousin, Angela Buono. How do you pronounce his last name? Is that Buono. something? Buono. Buono. Which ironically means good. Really? I did not know that. <laughs> right. And Angelo, so, of course, means angel, you know, like an angelic or, a, or an angel. So he's a, so the this is an example of a name that must have made God get a twinkle in his eye, you know, <laughs> of oh, wow. irony. So, yes. right. so, so let's let's set the stage again to to your initial observation. You see the TikTok video. You see the gal that went out on a date with him. Give give our audience a, a little bit deeper understanding of what was going on there. So this is. Um, one of several people who have come forward talking about these dates. And um, what she explains is that he flew, that Rex, she claims, 
that Rex flew her out from the West Coast and he took her to dinner in, uh, I think she says, Suffolk County, uh, out a little further out, you know, on the island there. And um, at the dinner, he starts asking her if she's a true crime fan. And um, in that conversation, she says, you know, uh, you know, he says, do you have a favorite serial killer? She says, no, I don't. And he says that he favors the Hillside Stranglers. That they're his favorite. And then allegedly goes on to ask if she's heard of Gilgo Beach and to discuss it, to give some ideas about it. Now, we know from a date that he went on, allegedly went on with a woman named, I think, Nikki Brass, who's been talking. But similarly, she's taken out on a date. He asks if she's a true crime fan. And in that conversation, asking if she's a true crime fan, he asks what she knows about Google Beach. And he starts talking about a, a hypothetical suspect. And he starts talking about how the killer probably fe felt about the victims. And he communicates to her essentially that the women would have been non-entities, that they would have been uh, basically um, wanton women that nobody would care about. And um, we have to remember that he would be having that conversation with somebody working as an escort. Uh, so that it's like an indirect way of kind of calling her a horrible thing. Right. And um, and that and what she says with this Nick with Nikki Brass says is that when he's discussing it, he changes visually and scares her because he looks as if he's going into almost a like a trance like memory and looking really, really into it. And this creeps her out. And then she says that he says to her, um, you know, you're going to come back to my place. He asks her multiple times. And she says, quote, he becomes agitated, right, when I say no, agitated. She said that he started to say things like, but I paid for dinner and took you all the I came all the way out here. You're not going to come back. So she says, it's late. I don't I, I'd have to drive my car to your place and then drive all the way back. And he starts insisting that they could get into his car, which is interesting also. And here we start getting an answer to the question of where was he taking these people? Where was he taking these victims? What it sounds like is the goal is to kind of toy with the question of whether they'd be open to some kinky SM like kind of sex by talking about serial killers that engaged in it. And then the idea seems to be to try to get them almost willingly to get in the vehicle. You know, it's like a vampire. You know, you've got to invite you got you've got to invite me. And so Gacy used to do that. Right. Like to get you to put the rope on yourself kind of a thing. And wow. then um, ultimately get you back to his place. It's what it looks like. And um, apparently he was even speaking to this woman about the burlap sacks about that it had been in the news that they were found in burlap and, and what was the point of that and all that. So so I think what you have, and, and she says, the, what Brass says, is that it seemed as if he wanted to boast, but he couldn't. Interesting. And so and I think it, it would be fascinating to hear Anne's thoughts on this, but this to me sounds pretty classic. Uh, so uh, Anne, what are, you, what are you thinking as you're hearing all this about what these well, dates are saying? Well, I think it's a test. Uh, he certainly had a, uh, not only did he have a, a preference for the way he would uh, lure uh, a potential victim in, but then he even had script that he was going to go through. And it depended, he'd probably check it off if, if they did something, that said the right thing or, or whatever. But the minute they said, no, I don't want to go back to your house or whatever the kind of the end, end point was. He would uh, that would interrupt the fantasy and he'd get very angry. So you wonder if when does he kill them uh, and where does he kill them? We don't know that he takes them back to the house, although I guess there's some information coming out that maybe he did. Or does he uh, because he has to drive them somewhere after he kills them unless he kills them at, out on the beach. Uh, doesn't have much uh, information on any of that about the method of murder. We suspect from what he says that he prefers strangulation, that it isn't clear whether it's ligature or manual. You know, we did a study on that, so I'll be interested to see what they think it was. One of his victims said it was, um, he had put uh, ribbon or something around the neck, so ligature. Sure. 
So I think back to your I question, think, Gary, that it uh, just gives us his script and, and, and the whole lore, if you will. Right. And how much right. he gets out of playing it. You know, it's like a, he's the actor and, and setting the scene. So it sounds like to set the stage here um, even further, you've got Rex in New York who seems to be somewhat impressed by the two brother or the two cousins out in California uh, to the point where he's trying to correlate that to the incidences that are taking place on Long Island. And obviously the gal that's hearing this is just going by, you know, the creepy feeling of what's going on in this conversation, but has no idea of what the extent this guy is or the what this guy is capable of. And that, and that's kind of right along what these two cousins were doing. They were, you know, pretending they were cops. And these are the two investigators who actually took them down. Uh, Detective Grogan from LAPD and Detective Salerno, Frank Salerno from LASD. And of course, it was an entire task force that was assembled of almost 100 guys uh, that were chasing leads during that time. And, and this was just pre- uh, you know, the behavior science unit stuff that's as you guys were just starting to kick off the study. And but mm -hmm. the correlation now, you know, thinking about it, and this is the shop. If he was taking him back to his house in New York, these guys were taken to the shop in mm -hmm. L.A. And this this picture I just took off of Google Earth today. That shop is still there on East Colorado in uh, Los Angeles, actually Glendale. Uh, but so let's talk a little bit about the, the psychological aspect of these individuals. So who are these guys, uh, Gary Bray, can and Anne, can you guys break that down a little bit deeper for us? I know that uh, Kenneth at five suffered from some type of uh, syndrome where his eyes would roll back into his head as a you know, even at five yeah, years he had, old. A, he had an injury where he her face planted. And um, but but according to his mother, she she talks about him or just to paraphrase what exactly she said, it was something like that he basically came out of the womb lying. That he was like yeah. a garden variety juvenile delinquent from day one, and that you couldn't trust anything he said. So that a lot of these stories about his history, you kind of have to take them with a grain of salt. He's like a master liar and manipulator. And um, I mean, there can be no question. Anyone who looked at him said that he is like the classic psychopath. And um, what's really interesting is working with a, another person on serial killing. I mean, Ann and I, if we were to talk about it, could probably name just a few people who did that. Uh, wouldn't you say, Ann, it's rather uncommon entering into that kind of intimacy and working with a partner to kill right. together? Very right. rare. Right? Very rare. Very rare. Very rare. And uh, it suggests a kind of a perversion of the construct of like having a friend. Right. Where, But what usually happens when you study these paired offenders, sometimes it's your romantic partner, sometimes a relative, a friend. But, but what tends to happen is that there's one very psychopathic dominant figure and the other one is a kind of a weaker willed ally who goes along with it. It's very confusing to law enforcement because you can even have two very different profiles that arise if one person does one thing and the other one does the other. But the idea is that that Bono was the adoptive cousin to Bianchi. And um, the interesting thing about Bianchi, who really is the center, I mean, when, when you know, if, if it's true that Rex talked about Bianchi being his, you know, about the Hills of Strangles being his favorite, he really means Bianchi. And um, Bianchi is, uh, you know, would definitely fall into that Ted Bundy category of psychopathic serial killer, sexually sadistic, very charming, handsome, so forth. And um, he was somebody who had really a very arrested development psychologically. He lost his father at a very young age and dealt with it by going into a kind of a complete denial that it ever happened. It's very interesting because that's a point I've repeatedly made about Hoyerman is that is that I felt from the very beginning, I've said it on this show multiple times, that yeah. he was sort of arrested at the death of his father, which would have been when he was 11. 
And here we have a guy obsessed with 10 year olds and so forth, according to his search histories, that house that is completely unchanged that he purchases from his mother as if it's some kind of shrine. And you get the sense of a person who never really got past that event, which is exactly what happened with Bianchi. How that figures into the psychology of these individuals is something to think about. We also know that um, Bianchi, you know, in addition to kind of becoming a master BS artist from the start, honed an MO where um, he and his cousin would would pretend to be police officers and they would lure women into the car under, you know, in that way, they would pick up sex workers with the idea of being that they were in trouble. You're going to have to get in the car. We're going to take you someplace. They were, according to um, this woman who went on the date with Rex, um, where she, he was talking about the Hillside Stranglers, he was explaining that what he liked about them was that they got up close and personal with the victims so that there was this ability to fearlessly kind of look someone right in the eyes and kill them. And that starts to give a clue of what was probably turning on Rex. That power, that looking somebody in the eye and being the arbiter of whether they live or die. I think it's very interesting that it, that people who are fixated on the deaths of someone in their life would be empowered by being the arbiter of life and death. Having control over who dies would be like a way of undoing that. I get to pick when I lose you. I get to pick when you're dead, right? So that, that it's a way of overcoming that feeling of powerlessness that would have been left from the death of a loved one. You also have in Rex calling up the family members of a victim and kind of mocking them for losing someone, which again speaks to someone who felt terribly insecure and lost and powerless with the death of this man. So that, that I think that's very important psychologically. Now with Bianchi, once these women are brought to a workshop area, right, to a place, this isolated place in a very organized way, there's strangulation. And then there's a kind of a honing of the MO to experiment with other things. So they started in injecting make, with lethal injection, carbon monoxide poisoning, yeah, I and also that. electrocution. Right. So that you start getting it. In other words, it's not enough to strangle. They start getting aroused by torture. And it is interesting to think about what was going on in the experimentation process in some kind of workshop area with Rex, if he is indeed the killer. I agree with Anne. We don't know if it was in the car, you know, in the truck. We don't know if it was at home. But let's remember, his wife's hair is found on some. So it's got to be someplace she is unless he's carrying it around on his body. But wouldn't you think, Anne, that the fact that his wife's hair was on some of these bodies sort of makes you wonder about where it was well them. yeah that's a curious factor because uh, I, I can think of one of the cases that we had where they had um taken a hair from a body bag which the victim had been in and had profile that it was african-american killer well it, the profile was that it wasn't and that was because when they finally went back and checked, it was a body bag that had not been adequately cleaned after the last victim. So it was, um, and, and they, the police were really thrown off by that. So I think you have to, this whole idea of the wife's hair, I'm going to be very curious about that. Was it from being wrapped in the, the burlap? Was it that? Uh, also on hair, you've got to have the root. And so, and that's usually hard to get. It can't just be a hair without the root. So I'll, we'll need to really watch how they present that as evidence at, at trial. But uh, that has been the curious thing of how, how the hair could have gotten onto the victims. So I have a question uh, for both of you and great observations. And I, I, so in, in the hillside, Strangler's case, and and I think a lot of people forget that there were two, you know, they were and they were cousins. It wasn't just one guy. I mean, Bianca gets all the you know the news, but his cousin was just as, if not worse. I mean, was there a personality split in terms of what each of these individuals would do, and if so, do you think Rex? 
merged both of the that sadistic behavior into his crimes? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And, and my question would have been too bad that the uh, date didn't say, well, which of the stranglers was your favorite? In other words, I know that um, if they, they could have merged it, but did she think that Bianca versus Rono was her favorite? Now, Bianca is very handsome. I mean, the picture says that. And so you don't know whether that had attracted Rex uh, when he was young, as a young teenager. The other thing that's quite different is their MO, that the... Um, from what I've read, that they would get the pretend they were a policeman, have have badges and everything, but then force them into the car. Now we see Rex doing something very different if he if he's the suspect, that he's able to get a date and say, well, let's go, but it's not clear if they get in the car, uh, whether that's when they when we were just talking earlier, if that's the point where the script changes when the victim doesn't follow the script that he gets angry. Um, the other point I wanted to make in, in just reading about the, the two stranglers is that they started out by deciding that they would find some runaway girls and uh, use them to as, as call girls or as prostitutes. And then when they uh, went to get a list of from a prostitute of likely persons, she tricked them and didn't give, gave them a false list and they were very angry and they were so angry when, when we say they, again, we don't know which one, but the revenge issue came up and revenge is turning out to be in all kinds of, of homicides, a huge issue of this revenge and getting even. So that, um, if that's so, we would want to look at Rex in terms of what is he so angry and trying to get revenge for you know why does he pick this particular type of of woman and and pick? so those are some of the questions i think uh interesting right. yeah the, the uh, clue that we're getting is that it what it looks like from minimal information available is that with the death of of, of rex's father he's left with a mother that he he's he sort of described as being a mama's boy but that she's also described as being kind of manipulative and challenging and so forth. So what you get a sense of is a person who's sort of confused if he idealizes or loathes this woman. And um, this, is, I think, is manifested in being somebody who, on the one hand, would go out and marry a woman who is a nurse and is very tender and kind and taking care of a special needs son and so forth. And then by night, going out and 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 really brutally killing if he is the killer brutally killing these women that it sounds like he thought were kind of wanton and that he had a disdain for so that you have this kind of what what sometimes is informally called the madonna whore complex where you don't know if you're idealizing or devaluing women and um it sort of seems to be happening at the same time the other thing is very interesting about about this guy is that his personality structure at baseline has a sadism to it where the more stories we hear it isn't only sex or, or sexual aggression that is an outlet for that but that even just like co-workers and other people pick that up that he couldn't let go of a grudge or so so for example there's a story told by a co-worker in his architectural firm which is very close to where i work so it sort of weirds me out that for years i've been thinking about this guy and he was like you know you could walk to like throw a stone and right? and for the for the yeah. audience what right. uh, gary sent me a yeah. picture of where the pizza was the other day he stayed no, yeah, next right. to right. where the pizza right was there. i'm like oh yeah. my gosh but go ahead i didn't yeah, mean to right interrupt there. you sorry yeah, yeah. yeah no on. no no it, it's true and um but but um so what was i saying though about the i lost my no the co-workers, the co-workers the oh, co-workers yeah so the thank you so this co-worker said that, that another woman who worked in the firm decided she wanted to go work for a different group. And they found Rex standing outside her window, staring up at the window of that coworker. Couldn't let it go. He was furious, supposedly, about this. And because he was always boasting about his gun stash, people got scared about that. There's another story told about him that 
he loved to talk about how he would dress it a bear, kill a bear and dress it and hang it up. And that when he would talk about it, it creeped people out because it was like, might as well have been describing a person and all the butchery of the and hanging it up and so forth. And um, another thing about him was this, this idea that um, he once had some kind of argument with someone and cut the man's boat in half meticulously. Right. Wow. So that, that what you have is a guy who has a reputation for being somebody you just don't want to run afoul of. He's just a, like an angry guy. And it almost, you know, it, it's not surprising he had to go so far to find people who would trust him, you know, to come from other states and whatever. He had that kind of reputation. So I think, and one thing that's really interesting is he actually wasn't very good at hiding his nastiness. He doesn't really have mm. that mask that you see in people like Bundy and other people where they're slipping like a chameleon, you know, through the world. This guy's split was more brittle. And if you just poked him a little bit and, and gave him a sense of powerlessness, he felt the need to assert dominance, like almost immediately. And um, the other thing I think we have to talk about that, that Anne will have a lot to say about this, I'm sure, um, because it gets right to the serial killer study that she was part of, is the way that Bianchi and Hoyerman, uh, by accusation, both would insinuate themselves into the investigation. So like Bianchi would actually, he was like trying to volunteer for the police and he would get in the squad car and yeah, get them to tell him information about yeah. the investigation and go back and tell Bono about it. And, um, and what we see with Hoyerman is a lot of searching around and trying to get information through Google searches and so forth about what was going on. And he was even investigating another suspect to see if maybe they were going to think it was that guy, right, I suppose. So, and I mean, that would be interesting to hear about. I mean, that's a pretty common phenomenon with these guys, right? Right, because, again, that's part of the script, that uh, not only after they kill, that they can see how the investigation is going, and they can, uh, remember Kemper used to even volunteer his his help. I, in another case, he the uh, killer was so good that the police actually did make them him the person that anyone had any tips to go to in, in the uh, building. Right. So that is not uncommon. In fact, it's probably more common than we realize. It's just that it's been harder to, to get that. It um, is psychologically very, very important to them to say that they, and it's a way of also getting away with it. You know, they can uh, get some information and how close are they getting and, and so forth. And should they do anything? But he really got away with it well, for what, a long time. I mean, that's the other thing that is, we don't have much information on part of his life to see if there were other crimes that he was uh, committing, that there was an escalation. Usually there is an escalation and it, it, uh, uh, you, you would want to know that just to start out at what in 19, well, they have the new, they have the fifth victim finally identified. Uh, don't know whether she's involved as one of his victims, but uh, look at the number, of the age that he's at when he's caught is really uh, much older than we've seen. You know, it's fascinating to to listen to both about, you know, the fact that he was traveling, you know, he went to Vegas and it seems like he was, you know, u utilizing escort services, but and now this gal comes forward and we're hearing from others maybe the, about his fascination with the hillside stranglers. What, what of those, what's going on up here that he's trying, is he trying to find a better way of doing it? Is he researching? What, what do you think is going on uh, there when he's probing uh, potential victims that far? Yeah. One thing that we get from, uh, as Gary said, the the one victim that attempted, well, we don't even know she was an attempted victim, but that he talked about getting so close. So it was actually the murder itself, the details of getting close and putting, I don't know if he said much to her, but it's the actual part of killing. And that's when I think Gary said that he went into a kind of a fugue state or a uh, dissociative state, whatever you want to call it, because he was so much into it. They like to relive this and they only, when they can talk to another person, 
rather than just have to relive it in their own minds. That gives them so much more power to the um, to the fantasy. And the act is not a fantasy; it's an actual act. So he's deep into the fantasy at that moment during the conversation. Yeah. It, it, do you think he's picturing it? Uh, how he would victimize the individuals he's communicating with? Oh, I think so. Yes. I mean, yes. we've seen that. I know that a couple of cases that I've done, and I think even the BTK killer, when you get them yeah. talking about it, they can, they can go right into it and right. even talk about it. I remember one where even was getting aroused because right. it, it was a, we're in jail doing the interview. Right. Right. Well, well, we know, and I've, I've talked about this uh, elsewhere when discussing uh, Rex, is that um, there are serial, sexually sadistic serial killers. For example, Paul Bernardo. Paul Bernardo talked about his MO when he he was looking for a partner to engage in these acts with him, which was um, Carla Homolka wound up being his uh, partner and his wife. Um, and he said that he would go into a bar and he would intentionally make lewd jokes to see the horror on women's face. And then he would hone in on the woman who didn't get horrified, who was interested, who looked amused by his referencing things in lewd, you know, aggressive sexual statements. And I think there's a little bit of that because what it looks like is that for this guy, I'm not sure, but what it looks like is part of what he wanted to project onto the person was that they were a bad woman. And I think he he needed the victim to almost want to go back to his place and do aggressive things, sexual things. So there's like a fishing for, would you mind that? Would you like that? Do you find that titillating? And if she says yes, and then she's willing to go back with him, he then feels justified in punishing her for that. So it's like a way of kind of getting her to, to, to show that she's what he needs her to be based on his particular prototype. And if a woman wasn't interested, then he, it, he would have to find someone else. So that there is that vampiric quality of, I want you to invite me in. When Gacy did it, Gacy would give the, the, the victim, whether it was a minor or an adult male, the, the garrote with the stick or whatever he was going to use for asphyxiation. He would say, you want to see a trick, you know, whatever. And he would want the person to put the rope around their own neck before performing the trick. And then later when he was asked about it, when he, you know, it, you know, sometimes he would say he didn't do it. And sometimes he would be boastful or whatever. But what he would say is, is that it was like they had killed themselves. That's a hideous thing to say, but it's like a way of saying it's your own fault that you're dead. I was simply the executioner. You were the, you know, or in a way you executed yourself, right? You know, I, you got into your own noose. But, you know, and so there's that self-righteousness. Remember, Gacy would even read Bible verses to some of these people. He was punishing them for, I guess, the idea that, that, that he viewed them as young males that were willing to be in this kind of intimate encounter. Because I think he was projecting his, his loathing of his own gay identity onto them. Although some of them didn't even think of it as a sexual encounter. They just thought they were hanging out with this guy who was paying them to do something. So that you had that kind of thing where in Gacy's mind, it was an intimate encounter and I'm punishing you for it. So I think we have to understand that if we want to get why part of the thrill for this guy was going on a date, whining and dining someone, you know, and trying to impress them or whatever, and then tossing in these little questions. It suggests also that he thought he was very slick and interpersonally clever, but the, but these women were getting creeped out. He wasn't particularly good at it, right? So so that I think that's the other thing is he's not Kenneth Bianchi. He may think he is, but he's not Kenneth Bianchi. To me, he's more like Bono. <laughs> Interesting. He's more so like the sidekick, right? The odd, the odder side, sidekick than Bianchi. Do you think he would compensate for that? Because, uh, you know, in his mind, he isn't, you know, the handsome. I, yeah. Yes. You know, yes. serial killer. I think he was I think he understood that he wasn't 
he was sort of schlubby. He wasn't particularly desirable. They used to tease him and make fun of him. I mean, they called him Huraman Monster, uh, you know, because of his large size and his goofiness and his ugliness or whatever people felt about him. And um, so that, that, that the idea is, you know, uh, he's described as ogre-like. I mean, you know, so this is a guy whose self-esteem was kind of down. And he finds that, you know, he's very gifted at this architectural stuff. He's making money and so forth. And this becomes a way of compensating uh, uh, for that. And I think that's psychologically very important to this guy. Is Now, if you think about it, Chris, and then it's very disturbing, this idea of plucking a sex worker out of total obscurity. She could be living in the, on the West Coast, Maine, you know, all these different places we hear. He plucks her out of obscurity and makes her feel like she's special, takes her out to dinner. He wants to know all about her. He's asking about her favorite this and his favorite that. She's getting you know, treated like she's special. And then he has to devalue you. So there's something about this idea of like taking someone who's devalued, elevating them just to sort of knock them down and laugh at them. That also is very perverse. And it sort of makes you wonder, is that what happened to him? Did he feel really good once in his life and then get knocked down and feel like a fool? And that, again, makes me think about the father. There was a good time in his life. It got robbed from him. Now he's humiliated and he has to go out and project that onto someone else. So I'm very suspicious. That's what happened to Bianchi. Right. Very, very suspicious. Right. And by the way, everybody forgets Bianchi was a New Yorker. Bianchi was born in in, in Rochester. (laughs) So he's got he's from the same state too. Interesting. FYI. Yeah. And, and, and what are your thoughts, Doctor Burgess? What are your thoughts uh, on what Gary's talking about there? Well, I think that's really really interesting. I also, how do we factor in that Bianchi's mother uh, relationship with the mother because she's the one that uh, I got her. She's the pro, was a prostitute, and when we talk with especially with men that have had that kind of an experience where the mother may bring in other men and there's men that come and go. I'm not saying that's necessarily what happened with him, but it could be. And so the anger that builds up over that, that there's a, uh, whatever happened to the father, Gary, do you know what happened to Bianchi's father? Died of Uh, pneumonia. Do you know the age? I, I think that Bianchi was about six years old, if I remember, something like that. But I always thought it was interesting that the father dies of pneumonia and he gets obsessed with like manipulating breath. Yeah. So it's sort of that's why I had, I had been curious how Rex's father dies, because there's some again, I think it's about being the arbiter of who lives and dies. So that idea yeah. that the father dies of a breathing problem, pretty fascinating. Right. And, uh, you know, so. What, what about the parental history with Bono? He was adopted. Is that true? With with who? With with Bono? Uh, Bono. Yeah, I think it's like through adoption, he becomes his cousin. Yeah, so somehow. And, but I don't know much. Country. I'm not sure anybody really does know much right. about that. I mean, I can look into it, but. Yeah, some abuse or some I neglect agree. from the uh, biological parents. That's another thing to might have played a part in the uh, there, too. But it sounds like also, and maybe Chris, you know this, is that they did, once they committed the murders up in Washington, that they caught them fairly quickly. Yeah, they caught, they caught Kenneth because uh, they started to have this paranoia towards each other, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, towards the last murder in LA. And actually, uh, Angelo pulled a gun on his cousin and told Mm -hmm. him, you know, look, this was after the ride along that Dr. Bricotto was talking about. Uh, you know, Bianca went on a ride along with LAPD and was asking questions you know, about the investigation. And that circulated back into the task force. And they were like, you know, who is this guy? So he was actually brought in like four or five times and interviewed, but they didn't have anything, yeah. you know, that could substantially connect him. So, Essentially, Angelo started freaking out, getting paranoid. And so he told his cousin, you know, we're done. You you get out of here. And so Kenneth went up to uh, Washington State and killed two girls uh, in a house while dressed as a security guard. 
he he lured them with the security uh, aspect to house sit. And when he got them down into the basement, he had, he had played like the lights were out. The first girl came down in the basement and he strangles her. And then, of course, the second girl, he strangles her. But then he sticks them back in their car and they're ultimately discovered uh, in that vehicle. And that was his downfall. And that's when they twisted him uh, to testify against his cousin to avoid the death penalty mm-hmm. uh, up there. And so that's how they kind of took him down. Uh, but, you know, I have a I have a quick question with you. You both have talked about and, and, and Gary, you've you've really pounded on this from the first conversations we've had about this overbearing mom situation. I mean, in terms of what's going on there, I mean, what it, let's get a little bit into that, uh, you know, theory and why you're feeling that is going to become more and more uh, predominant in Rex's case. Well, first of all, when we look at attachment theory in psychology, we have to remember that the way we're going to relate to people, particularly romantic partners, is going to be extremely biased by the way that we connected with parental figures uh, as children. Uh, And um, what happens is, for whatever reason, there does seem to be a particular manifestation that you see in people who had uh, either unstable or manipulative or, you know, kind of irregular, dysregulated, emotionally dysregulated mothers, abusive mothers, because for some reason, and I always thought on a Jungian level, you know, there's this idea of like Mother Earth and so forth, you know, it's like this idea that when if you don't trust your mother you develop a kind of a sense that the world itself isn't really good it won't take care of you nobody loves you there's never going to be arms around you that rock you to sleep and tell you everything's okay and you develop a kind of a a, of a basic mistrust that that seems to happen there and uh, it's a little different than what happens when people have disturbed relationships with father figures and um, so what starts to happen with some of these guys is from the time that they're even young teenagers, just before puberty or in puberty, they start mixing up sex with this idea of wanting to get even with this kind of a figure, this maternal figure, or there's some kind of disconnect between the way the mother treated them and the way other women treat them. And it starts getting all kind of confused and associated with getting aroused. And um, and then, of course, they hone it and hone it and hone it until there's a desire to go out and sort of use it to play it out. And um, this is this whole idea of escalation of that transition to to, to going out and trying it. Uh, and I mean, and uh, you probably heard that almost like a blueprint over and over again with these serial killers, that they had these relationships with women in their life that they then kind of go out. and punish. Right. Absolutely. But we also don't forget we have the absent mother or the neglectful mother wow. that um, is set up that way. It doesn't even have to happen like you described if, if the being the overdominant. So you, you got these two presentations, if you will, of the mother and, and what the mother means. So uh, it sounds like Bianchi had the mother that's never there or bringing men in or whatever, and possibly also Bono who we don't know why he gets adopted, the, the parents, you know, whatever happened there. Whereas what we have in Huerman is a situation where for all purposes, it looks like they had a, certainly had a relationship. The parents were in a relationship and the father dies. So there's the separation that way. So right. you can look at it, but, but I, I couldn't agree with you more that it's so important what these formative years are with kids and the, um, events that can happen to kind of confuse them all the more. Yeah. And to your point, and go ahead. I'm sorry, Doug. No, 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 please go ahead. No, to your point, Dr. Burgess, I mean, um, obviously, you know, Bianca, I mean, his mother at the time was a prostitute working the streets when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, didn't you say that Charles Manson's mom uh, really played a significant role there as well? Can you explain that? Yeah, Charles Manson, and you almost see a different presentation by Manson. 
his mother was a prostitute and they, they he didn't even know where his father was now sometimes in these situations they don't know the father the biological father so that can even present more more problems but what manson does and and he was a small guy uh manages to get all these women and i think one text was one male to do what he wanted was so controlling that he could get them to do to make do all these murders uh, themselves. I mean, that's rather, uh, maybe Gary can comment on that. That's almost a different kind of a thing. I think you were saying that the, in the, um, kind of in the humorman situation where he plays out, is trying to play out the fantasy and the script and so forth. But with Manson, he actually gets them to do it, to do the murders. He never, as far as everyone knew, never killed anyone. Interesting. Well, because I think that one of the things that gets underplayed when we think about what sexually sadistic, you know, serial killers or other types of serial killers are trying to do when they're undoing their pasts and regaining control or so forth is, is that they're trying to stabilize their love objects. They, they are trying to make people predictable. And so this idea of asserting complete control and forcing people to prove their loyalty to you to the point of killing for you is is very interesting when you think about it from an attachment angle I, i'm very very interested in serial killing as it relates to attachment theory and uh, you know these people have deeply disturbed attachments with very i mean you think about bundy for example everybody always says bundy is on the list of people who really didn't have any terrible things happen to him well don't forget bundy was raised thinking that his biological mother was his sister Right. And then is told one day that that's his mother, that she had got pregnant out of wedlock and everybody hid it from him. So now he can't even trust his grandmother that he thinks is his mother and he can't trust the biological mother. So that, of course, you start to develop a mistrust. And of course, he's dumped by this woman that he had developed this relationship with that he idealized. So now his basic ability to trust women is totally deteriorated. And that, in conjunction with a kind of psychopathic character structure, was like a recipe for disaster. And um, so it becomes like a proximal event that sends him out. Now, I'll tell you, fascinatingly, about Bianchi is Bianchi is a good example of a compartmentalizer, you know, that could think of women as, you know, the Madonna or the whore kind. And when he was in prison, he developed a, a pretty fascinating relationship with a woman named uh, Veronica Compton. And he actually convinced this woman. You can't make this stuff up. He wanted this woman to make it look like there was a killer out there that was actually responsible for the murders and that he was incorrectly imprisoned. So he mailed inside of a rubber glove, mailed semen to her oh my. to put on a person to so that, that, that the police would think that they had arrested somebody who was not yet incarcerated. And she also talked about that there was this idea that um, they were going to, like, buy a mortuary and he was going to engage in necrophilia and all that. And the necrophilic stuff is interesting, too, because I always say the serial killer that, that Hoyerman reminds me of the most is Gary Ridgway. Same formula, the abusive yeah. mother, the, you know, going out, targeting prostitutes and sex workers, dumping them, strangulation by ligature or manual the splitting, the not killing when he's with a wife, but when he's alone going out and doing it because of the split. And um, and in his case, there was necrophilia. In the case of Hoyerman, we don't hear that. But there had been all this speculation about this creepy doll in the house, this effigy. Now, in this press release where the wife, you know, finally voices herself, there's this idea that she owned the doll. But I would like to remind everyone that that does not preclude that it was being used for sexual purposes. Just because it was his wife's Icelandic doll that was in the house doesn't mean there isn't a reason the police took it to look at it. <laughs> so we don't know what he did with it. I don't I don't know why people think that rules out that he was doing something with this childlike doll that that certainly makes me hope they are swabbing it and looking at it for DNA and so forth. But you do see that kind of that desire to completely control something that's not moving, an inanimate thing that's dead or doll-like or whatever. 
So that again, the theme that comes up is controlling the behavior of something that, that hurts you or leaves you. Now you assert control over it and you dictate everything about it. It can't even die because it's a, <laughs> that's the thing. It's a doll or it's already deceased. The person's already deceased. They can't even have death anymore. So that, that again, you have that theme of arbitration of who lives and who dies and dictation of their behavior. Once you get that stuff, you start you start to see that this is all about attachment and relationship problems. I mean, and uh, I don't know how much you'd echo that, but I think it's a big theme. Well, I, I do too. Uh, we've always looked at that. Look at David Berkowitz. Yeah. Remember when he was adopted and then when he goes and finds out that the mother kept the second child, which was uh, the, uh, his sister, that is when that seemed to turn him into uh, the anger, the revenge, that, that kind of thing. So we can have all various formulas, if you will, on how the mother or the father uh, are played out in the child's life, but they're very, very important. So I, I couldn't agree with you more on attachment. Very, very important. So I have a question. So we've talked about Ridgeway and some of his, you know, darkness in relationship to how that correlates to Rex. And then now we have this, you know, Bianca Bruno correlation here with some of the things that we're seeing there and his fascination with those guys in LA. And I'm just wondering in his mind, in your experience with these guys, does it, uh, do they adapt? I, I know they adapt through their crimes, but do they adapt psychologically by studying the offenders like the Hillside Stranglers, you know, and, and so how does that play out in your opinion? Well, it sounds like a, I mean, Anne could certainly speak to that. Eh? Yeah. Well, right. I mean, I'll, I'll, I think what's so important is that we look at these cases because they can repeat certain things. I mean, look at all, all the, the various ones we've talked about. We only talked about mother father relationships kind of thing. But you learn so much, and then that's how the profiling works, that you can, you have enough history, if you will, in cases, and then you get a new case. And so you begin to ask the right questions and see if you can put it together. And I think that's the value of going over these cases, and especially he gave us the information that he he uh, he idolized or whatever, his favorite, I guess the favorite was... Um, the hillside stranglers as i said i just wish it, we, we knew which one but maybe he he merged them together and had just one uh, but he doesn't have a partner as best we know uh, he operated as a lone a single as best we know but we don't know so much because there was so much time we don't even really know unless he tells us which he hasn't um, how, the method of death um, one of the victims we just learned in the last couple of weeks, all they found first were her legs. And then they don't find her skull for years. So what happened to it? It certainly wasn't out there. And what about the, her torso? What about other parts? I mean, that's something, um, something's amiss here that evidently they have information. Chris, I would hope that they would have some information and maybe they're just not publicizing it, which is fine. It is there a duality of fl frustration that takes place uh, in, you know, the fact that they dismember potentially their victims, but then they put them out in the open as if they want them discovered or, you know, in some of these cases, they're wrapping them, he's wrapping them in burlap. Uh, I mean, is there a frustration that they're not found, you know, soon enough or and well, are you? Oh, don't forget, we see them go back to the scene and then I, I can yep. think of Henry Wallace, and then he he would move them so that they would be found. But the other thing is there are missing parts. A lot of these killers will right. take parts of the body for, I don't know if the souvenir is the right word, but uh, for memories, so, so to speak, to keep the memory alive. So right. all of these things, the, the whole sensory system of, of what these killers see, hear, smell, taste, and keep is real really is uh, educational for us for the next case that we come on. Interesting. Well, Dr. Chris, Ann and I um, and Victor Patricka 
systematically studied dismemberment uh, mm -hmm. for paper we did. And um, first of all, Anne and Michael Stone and I, Michael Stone was a mentor yeah, of Don, mine that I wrote Don, in Don, Evil Dr. with. Stone. Mm -hmm. um, we worked together at the time Michael and I did the New Evil to come up with formalized definitions of dismemberment and mutilation because the terms were being used interchangeably in the literature. If you like looked up dismemberment or mutilation on Wikipedia, you'll see that we gave that it's it lists us as coming up with the definition. Yeah. And um, the the what we decided was that if a large part of the body the head the torso the pelvis the legs the feet the hands or the arms were either removed or or de de destroyed in some way that's dismemberment and mutilation is the destruction or removal of any smaller part of one of those parts so if you decapitate a person that's dismemberment but if you butchered somebody's eye that would be mutilation right and so one thing that's interesting is when we looked at it, we found that dismemberment was, which might look very disorganized, right, is actually a very organized thing to do. It's mostly done by people that are eliminating evidence, particularly as we move into this like DNA era where they want to remove as much evidence as possible. You even see mutilation of things like teeth and tattoos and things like that. So that I think when you're profiling now, you, years ago, you might have thought, this is a disorganized guy. Look at all the butchery. But it turns out that that it's a pretty organized thing to do if you're doing it to get rid of evidence. And so um, what what's interesting is if you look at the, 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 the victims um, of whom Rex is accused, there is no butchery at all. They're whole. And so that almost makes you wonder about the other people that are found perhaps more mutilated or butchered. What it looks like is that this guy was putting them in burlap and sort of leaving them whole. And um, I don't know why. I, I don't know if he was going back out there, you know, for necrophilic purposes or just to be with them or whatever. But there's something about this idea of like always knowing where they are, collecting them in one place that I think is psychologically important and makes sense in terms of this guy's at least the supposed history. Um, and um, think, for example, of that story about him being so upset about a woman wanting to leave the firm that he has to go to her home and look into the window. What that says about how attached he would get to a person and how furious he would be that they would, <laughs> that they would dare leave him. You start thinking, who was the original woman that this guy felt abandoned by? that's getting projected onto this coworker, like this idea of you're unfaithful to me and you go out and you, you know, and you kind of like go with somebody else. That's really interesting. Now, one other thing I'll say is that I heard, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that the reason for the divorce for the first wife, which was a three year marriage, I believe it was from 1990 to 1993 was that she found out allegedly that he was bringing, he was going with prostitutes. Now, this is very interesting because I have said previously and elsewhere, and I think I, I think Anne would echo this, is that in these splitters, in these fragmenters, sometimes it spills over. And the partner that's on the good side of the split starts to notice that something is amiss, that you're doing something sexually perverse or inappropriate, and they leave you or they get upset. I mean, I, I there are people like, for example, Henry Lee Wallace. So we could talk about in that the the white he had a very good relationship with a woman, and then he started being inappropriate in the bedroom, and she didn't want to be with him anymore. And this precedes him going out and killing, so that he gets abandoned by the good woman, uh, and uh, and she catches it that he's getting too violent sexually. So he was trying to be a splitter, but it spills over. And, and wouldn't you say that's a, that's a phenomenon too, seems to have happened here. Oh, absolutely. Um, I was going to make one other comment before we leave the dismemberment thing, because you learned oh, yes, so many please. things. Uh, there was one of our cases in the 36 serial killers where he claimed there was no, he didn't do anything. He couldn't remember what happened during the murder, blah, 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 all of that. And the luckily the in the autopsy of one of the victims they had had put in the autopsy report that her fingernails were missing oh wow. so yeah so uh, um that was something we were able to use in the interview uh when he's trying to deny all this and look like the, you know, and say well what did you do with the fingernails 
So he was minimizing it. Yeah, he, ah, yes. He, he, yeah. he, or then he said, well, he couldn't remember. Well, obviously he was torturing her, pulling out her fingernails when she was yes. alive, obviously. So, yeah, that's right. um, and that's something that you don't think about and, and you would want them always to, to watch for, uh, certainly from a forensic pathology standpoint. Interesting. So Lou has a question that's out of my pay, pay grade. Um, well, so I'm confused because the person would have to explain what they mean by the Omni-Man paradox. Yeah, what's that? Um, I'm not sure what that means. It's not a term I've ever heard. Anne, have you ever heard of that term? No, I, I'm fascinated. Uh, it's unusual yeah. for me. I'm, yeah. I, I, if it's obscure, I tend to know it, and I have not heard of that. Um, I can tell you in terms of IQ with Rex that um, I looked at some data from the serial killer database, which is run uh, down at Florida Gulf Coast with Radford. That's the largest study of serial killers there is. And there does seem to be a, and I've said this before, a relationship between serial killers that engage in some degree of torture and, and higher intellect. So that it's not surprising, for example, that this accused guy was working in architecture, that it seems to have something to do with the idea that it's a kind of an experimentation or a, a psychological kind of um, stimulation to protract the death in that way. And in a weird way, a kind of a way of studying people. It's like, a you know, what does it feel like to have strong feelings? Because I don't, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's kind of interesting when you think about it like that. And um, we certainly see that in other people who have a similar style where there's this probable mixture. I mean, we have, nobody has studied Rex, but there's so, you know, one might, Omni -Man might say he's got certain personalities. Lou is saying like Omni-Man comic. Oh, so. yeah. I, I'm not familiar with it, but but if they could, if they want to type up a little explanation, I could give my thoughts on it. I'd be happy to. <laughs> she she stumped the panel. She stumped all three of us. Or Lou, Lou did. Chris, Chris, uh, Chris, did I tell you that Kenneth Bianchi communicated with me about my book? No. No. Oh yes, my. I've got to tell you this story. I uh, this always cracks me up. So a a journalist that I know went to interview him in uh, Washington, I think, and asked him if he had heard of my book. He said, I thought, I think you'll like this book. Kev Bianchi read the book and came back to the journalist and told him to communicate to me that he didn't like the scale that Michael and I have in there because his rating wasn't high enough. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my yeah, God. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Which is hysterically funny to me. Where do you that, have him? Where do you have him? Like Where do you have Where do you him? Have he him? would be uh, with the non-protracted torture you'd be at category 18. And I, my guess is he was irritated. He wasn't a 22. And then we have the inversion of it where Lawrence Bittaker reached out to me and Michael Stone when we were giving a talk with Ann at Boston College. He contacted us, Lord knows how, through a woman that was going in and interviewing him, who was also speaking at the event, to complain that he didn't like that you can't get a lower score if you've redeemed yourself, you know, that, that, you, that you're frozen at the higher score. So it's like you can't help but laugh at this kind of stuff. But with Bianchi, I just thought there was something about that idea of, you know, I'm not you're not representing how bad I was, you know, in this kind of pantheon of, of serial killers. And I just I just found that so fascinating. Yeah, he yeah, wants so to be the best serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. Bad yeah. he's not evil enough. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Which is, which is an interesting uh, point, uh, perfect segue, actually. Um, I mean, there's a lot of discussion. We've talked about Gary, uh, but there's a lot of discussion about even, you know, Dennis Rader trying to stay in the news by comparing yeah. himself, yeah. Rex or Rex to him. And I don't see the correlation there. Do, do you? Do either of you, I mean, just the, the only correlation I see is this idea of the of like the family man that is like by night a serial killer, or even at least this guy's accused, the serial killer, the interest in asphyxiation, that that kind of thing, and being kind of sexually sadistic, that 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 stuff. But it's sort of yeah. um when you really get into the nitty gritty, they're really very different. Because remember with, and, and I, I really would love to hear Anne's thoughts on this, but you got to remember, uh, Raider is 
somebody who was targeting families, not sex yeah. workers, families right. or right. a woman he would become fixated on. And he could right. meticulously study the house. There was no like taking the person out and getting to know them. It was like going in, surprising them, you know, and doing all that. There also seemed to be um, a, a perhaps a, at least initially a focus more on the children when it comes to like the victimology and all that. The, the adults almost seemed secondary with, mm -hmm. with Rex, it's like adult women, although they're small, they're adult women. Um, but but I don't really. Th and, th and also that thing of um, kind of like wanting all that attention and inserting yourself. I suppose you got a little of that going on. But Rex wasn't is not accused of like contacting the police or anything. He was contacting victims, family members, <laughs> It's different, right? So, yeah. and what would you say? Yeah. I mean, I think they're very, I think they're different. Oh, I think they're different too. And I, I you just explained it. I think to the going to the yeah. families afterwards is incredibly, um, if you would, uh, muted sadism, if you want a, a word that uh, that's so cruel to, to do that. Um, I, I think there have been a few cases where of others I can think of, but uh, that that is so different. And certainly Dennis Rader didn't do that. And he was kind of stayed in the neighborhood and he knew his victims. Yeah. These are uh, the ones that target uh, escorts and, and that they're going to be primarily strangers. So, and it's a very different, different group and they do very different things. And I think means very different things to them. Um, so I would say more different. Yeah, and, right. and bringing right. people home would also be very different than yeah, going into someone really else's easy. home. That right. But where I think that what I think is interesting is that thing of family members who are shocked that somebody right under their nose is doing this thing. And I suppose the other similarity they have is that in their workplaces they were difficult, meticulous, you know, yeah. people that led this lived this kind of life where it was their way or the highway. I mean, so the, but I think some of those they're like sort of superficial. Um, things that you see in common because that could be said of like many men who commit serial sexual homicide but when you really get into the nitty-gritty i think they're pretty different and um i think the the people that come to mind with him are a lot more like ridgeway gacy right. perhaps right. the hillside strangle that kind of offender a little bit different different yeah I would agree. what's a fascinating dynamic with social media today Mm -hmm. they they yeah. can they can weigh in yes. they, they they can weigh in this is a whole new dynamic i think that in the next 10 15 years uh we're going to see these guys and i think this rex case is a perfect example who would have thought that raider would have raised his hand and say, hey, I want to tell you that guy's not as good as me, or by the way, he's actually like me. And I can't wait now, Gary, based on your your point a couple of minutes ago, to hear what Bianchi says. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it, when, when it gets out there that he's his favorite, it's going to be interesting. I guess he's going to probably love it. It's yeah. True. And, and if he has to access remember, to those patch, right? Yeah, cause, cause, right. Because you have to remember, if if the need for domination and control is tied with sex, that doesn't mean that it's sexual. In other words, you could express that in all kinds of ways. And if you are in prison and you have no access to a sexual outlet, you'll take it out in some other way. You'll dominate and control the media. You dominate and control you know, some woman that you've connected with out in the world who develops a hyperstaphilic attachment to you. You'll do whatever you need to do because the, the, it ultimately comes down to domination, control, domination, control. This is why, for example, I've had situations where people are consulting with me and they'll say, I want to suggest you know, parole for this offender. He was sexually sadistic, but like he's an older man now. The sex drive has burned low. We don't need to worry about him going out anymore. And I and I remind them, it's not about sex. It's about domination and control. They're going to do that until the day they pass away. It doesn't matter if they're 100. So that that, that I think for these guys, this manipulation of the press and the, the, the world, the, the people out there is just the latest expression of that need. Mm -hmm. And um, with, with Raider, I think there's this kind of pathetic need 
to be kind of relevant all the time. I almost wish that they would stop putting his name in the paper all the time. It just yeah. blows his head off. Uh, and uh, it, it, wouldn't you say? Yes. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's too much. Yeah. And and the fact that, you know, I, I shouldn't have brought him up, but I, you know, I know that I've, I've read so many articles where he's, you know, he's adding his two cents. I mean, it, that's no different than taunting the police in my mind when he was doing all of his murders. I mean, it's, he's getting the attention that he's looking for and it, it helps him to relive those fantasies. Am I, am I off base there, uh, Dr. Burgess? I mean, um, that's. No, 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 not at all. Uh, the other interesting thing about him is two things that I always think of, of how he would control his neighborhood. Remember he would go around with a ruler. Yeah. And <laughs> measuring grass, the grass. Yeah. Measuring the grass and giving you a ticket. I mean, yeah. <laughs> my golly. And then the other is that he thought that he, he the uh, detective would uh, would not do him in, remember? And yeah. so when he said, why did you do that? He said, well, I, I wanted to catch you. And he and he just looked horrified, I think, was the detective's response. He did really, he thought that he, uh, you know, he wouldn't turn him in, so. Well, Very I can see, uh, yeah. I can see, or I can really see a shift and maybe we'll predict it here on this show with the three of us here that, you know, the more and more technology is that advances into the prison system and yeah. these guys who are on death row and or there for life, like Bianca, I mean, he got life without the possibility of parole. Right. So he's going to he's going to die in prison. And the more they let the technology in and they have access to the news, uh, it's going to be an interesting you know, study for one of your students one day. <laughs> you know, to go down and what kind of influence does that play right. in, in copycats and or active serial offenders in the real right. environment where they're not at, where they're not captured yet? Well, well, you know, th this stuff comes up for me when we're speculating about Kohlberger, about Brian Kohlberger, because we have to remember that if Kohlberger is guilty, we have to remember the Kohlberger was in a class where it was required mm. reading to hear about BTK, oh, who was a, a, someone mm. who was in a relationship, you know, a, 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 a kind of a study relationship with the instructor. And we have to imagine a disturbed individual sitting in the class thinking, I'd like to be even more interesting to her than BTK. I'd like to be the one that everybody's talking about and studying and analyzing, being fascinated by, you know, you get this, this kind of thing of, of wanting to be more interesting or better or higher. And that's why when we did the new evil, I was sort of worried about the scale thing, like adapt, adopting Michael's scale and kind of expanding it. Cause I was imagining offenders trying to top each other on it, you know? And um, I remember, I always tell the story that I remember a very prominent person. I won't say who it was, but a very prominent person, said to me, I want to give you a warning. There is going to be a day that you're going to find out about some murder where the offender had a copy of your book. It's going to be on the shelf in the house when they clean the house out. You're going to have to be okay with that. And the person told me it happened to them on multiple occasions. And then the authorities became interested in the book and what it might have said to the offender and all that. And I'm sure that's true with your books too. Oh, I know it has happened. Yes, yes. Yeah, on, right. on some other series. It, yeah, you, you, it scares that, me, you know, the idea of that. Well, it should, me. I don't know why it should, because they can go online and read all of our articles. Oh, well, that's true. Well, yeah. that's true. Well, that's and, true. and speaking of books, uh, we've got 2,200 people in here right now. If you haven't bought their books, both <laughs> Anne's, Anne's The uh, Killer by Design and Dr. Bricado, The New Evil, get to the link below, get those books and get them on your bookshelf. Uh, because they are fascinating reads. And, and as you can tell, we, we always have a master class here uh, with two of the brightest forensic minds in this country, a, a living legend and, a, you know, an author, a guy, a guy who could go on for days and tell us about these minutiae details about these, these individuals. I love, I love you both. Well, you're I so, you're so smart. And also tonight, uh, if you guys got here late, uh, pinned to the top in the chat 
is a fundraiser for a buddy of mine. Um, we need you to hit Eddie Reyes. Uh, he's, he's doing a battle with ALS. Uh, hit that link up there. Don't, you know, drop, get over there. He's a Marine, former Marine, a good cop, but he's having a fight with ALS. So uh, please get up there, hit that link as well and uh, donate to that cause to help him out there. It's sponsored by PORAC, which is the Police Officers Research Association of California. Just a super guy, super father, and just an amazing cop. But um, uh, anyway, get, get over and do that. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes. Uh, actually, oh, wow. We've been almost an hour and a half already. Yeah. We love it. Okay, so time flies when you're having fun. Where time flies when we're having fun. Okay, so I'm going to give um, uh, you guys the last word. I'm going to pull out here. Uh, let me see if there's any major questions that I missed. Uh, let's see here. I'm okay to answer questions, Anne, if you are, if you have a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. If anybody has questions first. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Chris, do you want to open it up to see questions? if anybody has any questions? Sure. If you guys have some questions and uh, uh, to the doctors here, this is your opportunity to ask, you know, the greatest minds is, you know, going on this, on understanding these, can I call them fruitcakes? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good one anymore, but uh, they love your sense of humor. Let's see here. Fantastic episode. Great. Miss Sophia Thank you. looks uh let's see here. Does he send a question in? I just got Dr. Picado's book. Uh, do you have a dog? Gary? I wish I did. I wish I did. I'm I you know I, I I'm crazy about dogs. I'm a dog nut. Uh, right. but I don't are, have one. But are yes, your books I, on audio? Are your books on audio? I, I can answer that for the new evil, it's on audible, but I you'll miss the um all the illustrations and um you won't get any of the charts on uh, like the graphs on certain crimes increasing and all that. So they just sort of got eliminated from the text because wherever there's, they're referred to didn't make sense. So you're sort of missing patches of the book. Um, uh, the, also the, just as a little quirk that drives me crazy about the audio book is I wrote the first half of the new evil, which presents the scale and all the cases and Michael Stone wrote the second, and then we did the end together and they forgot to mention that I wrote anything. <laughs> I got hey, the you know. It just seems it, it, like our names are on the packaging, but it doesn't say that I'm so. So just know that I wrote it. If you if you get it, oh, okay. uh, it's a little sort of accident of how it was yeah. recorded. But but it's um it's very good recording. And are your books on Audible? Yes, Killer yeah. by Design on Audible. Yeah, it it is, and they say it's very good. Um, the the, mm. the voice, you know, you have to. You have to get the right person, and evidently they did to read it. Yeah. So uh, the parent dynamic, fathers, mothers. Yeah. Um, what uh, that was the last question just before this one, or the thought. Uh, what are your thoughts on that in relationship to development? Do these individuals? Well, I I think that it's always important to look at that. The, the um, family history is critical, not only the parents, but the siblings, you, you need to get, and sometimes you have to <clears throat> get the information on the grandparents and who's been important to them in their life and that kind of thing will give you some idea of how asocial they might be or antisocial, whatever you want, <clears throat> so that they would um, be led to do that. So I think it's very, very important. I think, Gary, you agree. You're more into the Definitely. attachment theory, which is a, a great theory to yeah. This next question is really a good question. Um, yeah, it, it, this came up um, on a appearance I did on uh, somewhere else, and, and I've been thinking about this a lot. And um, there's one of two possibilities. One possibility is that when we see some dismembered victims and some that aren't, is that we're dealing with completely different offenders. I mean, that because somebody has a very clear MO, which does not involve any butchery of the bodies and they're left you know and then the same dumping area is being used by someone else another possibility is do you have someone were separated in time honed an mo and if the point was not that things were being done as part of a signature or as part of a psychological thing 
but was simply practical in nature. If the idea was like, what do I need to do to get rid of this body? And, you know, in a way that won't be detected to discard easily, you could have somebody who starts out doing things one way and does it another so that, oh, I don't need to dismember anymore. It's a lot easier to just put people in burlap and dump them or, or vice versa. So, so I don't know. I think the jury is out on that. But what it looks like so far is that the, the cases that are being tied to him do not involve any butchery of the body so that it may simply be that we've got someone, you know, someone else, who, perhaps Joel Rifkin or somebody else who had been active in the area. I mean, I think we have to remember that this would not be, if he is guilty, this would not be the only serial killer active there in that area. And um, so that's always been the big question with Lisk, right? I mean, was it one person or multiples? Uh, I mean, you know, and you don't hear about too many cases where multiple serial killers are active in the same geographic area like that. No. So it really throws things off. Yeah. Washington has places like that, though. Forests Washington and things. Does. Where, yeah, Green River Killer. Right. Yeah. Um, Ridgeway, right. sure. Uh, it's unusual. Yeah, well, who's yeah. yeah. very unusual. Involved. But yeah. So there, here's a good question. Are there serial killers that are developed without childhood trauma? That's an interesting question. And actually, it's Dahmer. When you listen to the Dahmer's father talk, um, he tries to say he noticed nothing unusual, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you hear Dahmer talk, he does talk, he does discuss what he would do as a kid, getting the roadkill. I always thought it wasn't roadkill. It was, you know, he killed uh, and dissecting it and getting involved in, in the in, he was more interested in the inner sides of, of persons. Oh. Did did I ever tell you about the refrigerator, the the pizza that was in the refrigerator at Dahmer's house with the human noses all over it? No. Do you know what kind of pizza it was? Uh -oh. It was a it was a Dahmer noses pizza. Dahmer noses pizza. Oh God. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh Chris. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I just had to break the. Break the air, though. That's okay. Here's That's another okay. great. Here's another great question here. How do uh, oh. yeah split, split with their daughters from their victims? How do they separate them? What do you think? Well, you have to remember that um, you're watching a daughter grow up, and so you're not necessarily viewing them as people who have done something with their life that makes you mad at them. You're sort of seeing them as like a you know, someone that could go either way on the road. And if you're a splitter, if you're a compartmentalizer, you're going to kind of probably see them on the good side of the split. That's funny. Don't quit your day job, Chris. There you go. <laughs> but but uh, you're probably going to see them on the good side of the split. And, um, you know, it's really amazing when we understand how compartmentalized these guys are. I mean, you know, I mean, I could tell you, we both could tell you cases of people who like would, would be like protective of a child and then go out and brutally kill a woman. Right. I mean, the classic one that I always bring up is Israel Keys. Israel Keys didn't want to confess to his sexually sadistic crimes because he was nervous that his daughter would have a bad image of him. So he made an arrangement that if I confess, she can't know about it until later. You know, wow. she's got to be a certain age and then she can know what I did. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a, a strange quality of compartmentalizing. You, you see that in a lot of psychopathic people. Um, I've always been amused. I've seen that a lot in organized criminals. Like you'll have a, a, a mafioso, let's say, that will have in his home a statue of the Virgin Mary with like a rosary strung around it and whatever. And he'll <laughs> kiss it on the way out the door make the sign of the cross and then go out and kill someone in a, you know, it's like this weird yeah. <laughs> like split in, in the person, you know, you saw that depicted in the movie, the sounds of the lambs. We had this very weird thing where you had a guy who was eating people who yeah. was horrified by rudeness. Do you remember that? That's like one of the things about Hannibal Lecter is, is that he, he can't stand someone who's lewd yeah. and yet he eats people, you know, it's like a, he, he, he kills one person because he doesn't like that, that he um, is inappropriate to a woman. He's inappropriate to, to Clarice Starling. So he, he has to kill him. 
So the, the, uh, that idea of that kind of fragmentation is we really have to understand how strong that split is. And it's so firm that it almost makes you think of like a kind of dissociation, like you see in a traumatized person where they can they can experience a, a separation of their feelings like that. And um, I think dissociation comes up in the Kohlberger case, because when people ask the question, how did he leave that sheath if he did it? How did he wander out and not kill those living women? I think he was in a quasi dissociative state. And was kind of not paying attention, right? Remember, he reported being dissociated uh, online. He talked about that. So I think we have to think of it as having a, a little bit of a traumatic core. I mean, wouldn't you say, Anne, it's a... Oh, yeah, it's, I absolutely split agree. The, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, even when you talk with uh, any of the children of serial killers, they will they are are shocked that this has happened. So they do keep it very, very separate. I, I Very I separate. That, yeah. And that's why some of them have a room or a workshop or something where that's the per that's the place where people die and then there's the rest yeah. of the house you know that's the torture area this is wow. the you know and you yeah. don't go in there you go here right. you know it's like a compartmentalization you know and, so and i will say that they're so controlling that they're able to control their family so that they don't i mean oh, in some families i'm sure they would go why my dad you know got this little secret room and he won't let us in we'll go find out what it is but they don't seem to yeah, if that cat right. gets out of the bag, it's over. Yeah. At that yeah. point. Uh, here's an interesting question. Do you uh, why did he Google himself? Do you think he wanted to get caught or was it a thrill? Oh, well, I wanted to know how the uh, investigation was going. I mean, I think that fits in with their trying to insert themselves into the investigation, that they would want to know what the what they know, what they don't know, where they're getting their information. So I think we have to keep that in mind when people are talking about them, uh, which they do. They'll go and look at peers and classmates and workers and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're just joining us, uh, the the show Mindhunter, one of the characters was actually uh, based off of Anne's life. Uh, and so she has seen and done just so much. And, we, and we're just so lucky to have her. Uh, always as a friend and a, a guest on this show here, because uh, I can only imagine it, what I want to ask you. Uh, I'm just going to ask you what, what's the creepiest case or <laughs> guy and that you had. And then uh, Dr. Bricotto, I'm going to ask you the same question, but Boy. You know, ladies first, my mom would never creepiest. Uh, okay, forgive I me. That oh, I think about this one, but who just, you just went, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, probably have to say the ones I know the best that we've really got a lot of material on, because once you get into these cases, uh, it's unbelievable what you can learn and, and find out. But I would certainly say um, Ed Kemper was was one that was really, really, um, I mean, he would say things like, I killed them so they wouldn't suffer. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> I didn't want them to suffer. I cared about them. So uh, that's the way their heads work. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's unbelievable. And, and yet he was so good that he would, uh, now he would take two at a time. He always more likely than not had two victims. And one that he took out, killed her. The second victim in the car knew it. And he managed to get her into the trunk of the car. Wow. Now, a lot of people, you know, wonder how, but that gives you, if you want to talk about terror and fear that he could so control that. And then he took her home and, and um, he had killed her and, and took her home. Now he was yeah. one that did take his victims up to after they were dead, but he had to kill them first so they wouldn't suffer. Well, I don't know who yeah. Gary thinks. He's got a lot of, of uh, choices. Too many, too many. Um, I think um, for some reason, with all of the serial killers that I have studied, the case that has always fascinated me the most and horrified me the most is the case of Albert Fish. No. Uh, and um, the reason that Albert Fish fascinates me is because he was a decidedly contemporary serial killer operating in the earlier part of the last century. He was very unusual. He was almost like a like a like a he, like a 
I don't know, bellwether of what was to come in terms of serial killing. And um, it's very difficult to talk about him without getting into horrifying details, so I will not. But I will say this. Um, Albert Fish um, was brutally abused as a boy in an orphanage, which was called St. John the Evangelist. And that's very important because he went on to develop psychotic fixation on the idea that St. John the Evangelist was talking to him and telling him to castrate children. And um, he uh, he was a gay man who was married to a woman who uh, worked as a gay prostitute. Uh, and he would um, he, he was fixated on the idea of mutilating and then uh, ultimately eating victims and then calling up or writing to the family members and telling them in all every imaginable detail what he did to them. And um, he was a um, interesting guy because he was psychotic, probably schizophrenic, but he was also psychopathic, a very interesting combination. And there are things that Albert Fish did that if you take like a little sample of his story a, a criminologist could study them for years right just like one story I, I i told recently that i had unearthed i think it's just really really interesting is this um the most infamous case for albert fish was the killing of a little girl named grace bud who lived in manhattan i actually visited the the family home which is now a garage uh it's not far from union square park uh, in manhattan and he posed as an elderly farmer from upstate New York, went to the house in response to a newspaper ad. Uh, they were looking for like a worker or whatever. He brought cheese and said that it was made on his farm. By the way, he didn't own a farm. He said, here are some samples from my farm or whatever. And what really happened was that he, he had glimpsed a young male that was living in the home that he wanted to isolate and kill. And what happened is that upon his arrival, he spies the little girl, Grace Bud, the daughter in the family, was completely fixated on her, tells the family that he's going to take her to a birthday party, takes her by the hand onto a train, brings her off to a cottage where he strips and kills her, you know, eats her and writes to the family in excruciating detail about it. Now, this is the interesting part. He would carry around with him a series of tools that he called his implements of hell. They were partially for the, the, the person torture him as part of the arousal and partially to, to kill them. And he wrapped them all up in a package and he left them with a magazine vendor, I think, near the train. And he walks the little girl, he picks up the package, he gets on the train with her to go off to the place where he's going to kill her. And he intentionally leaves the package on the train. So the little girl will run back to the seat to grab the package and bring it to him saying, Mr. You forgot your package. Because he was aroused by the idea that it was almost as if fate had se had selected her, that she had chosen it by bringing him the package. Now, That's I bad. could study that incident for years and, and really, you know, because it's so cruel, so sadistic. so cr And there, I think Albert Fish is interesting, incidentally, from the Hoyermann angle, because he's one of these rare people that's erotically aroused by like contacting family members and saying, you lost someone. Ha ha. Here's what I did to them. They're dead. And, um, you know, interesting tidbit about him before I, I end this is um, he was studied by Frederick Wertham, the, the, the famous psychiatrist at Bellevue. And um, Frederick Wertham is known uh, for this quirky little thing he did, which was um, banning comic books. You remember in the fifties when, they, they thought that comic books were leading people to kill. They put a code on them that they had to pass the comic code authority. That's because the psychiatrist that was studying them had studied fish. And he became worried that kids were going to read those and be inspired in the same way the fish was to go out and do these terrible things. So, so he put this ban on reading about violence. And, you know, and that's why you remember those comics, Tales from the, Cri the Crypt, Vault of Horror. All that. Those were all banned because of Vertom. Because he wow. thought they were gruesome because of Albert Fish. Fascinating case. And um, he ultimately was electrocuted at Sing Sing and wanted to be because he thought it would be a masochistic thrill to be executed that way. And um, and then caused the electric chair to catch fire because he had so much metal that he had inserted in his body masochistically wow. that the, 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 the chair caught. I mean, he is a guy that I think epitomizes 
sexual sadism, but mingled with an incredible psychosis. And I just think he is the creepiest to me uh, because he was so sweet looking. He looked like a little avuncular, a little stooped over man. And at the end of his life, he said that he had killed a child in every state. Uh, in every single state, he had collected a victim. Uh, oh. And um, so, you know, remember, don't judge a book by its cover. You know, it it uh, it's fascinating. Case, Just yeah. by I me mean, listening to you talk yeah. about him and then measuring what available fuel and and you both understand what I mean by that is available yes. to the, mm -hmm. the psychology of, of these individuals on the internet today. And what does it, what does the next even five years look like? And I know you guys are doing groundbreaking studies. Uh, even as we sit here tonight, I know you're, you're working so hard on stuff that, you know, for the public to understand and, you know, for our audience to understand, you are looking at two masters who are helping to understand this horrific evil that there is no comprehension at some in some places uh, with yeah. it. But for law enforcement, it's because of doctors, you know, Burgess and Dr. Bricado and Dr. Petrucca and many others who are involved in the research of these um evil people. I mean, I don't even know if they, well, I can't even describe it sometimes because, you know, even in my career, you know, I, I, I worked, you know, close to 300 murders and, you know, a lot of them were gang killings. A lot of them were, you know, just right. random killings, but nothing prepared us even when after I retired to, to understand what these guys and gals are, are handling today. Mm -hmm. But thank goodness that DNA is keeping up. And then, of course, you have, yes. you know, good good defense teams, you know, stepping up and saying A, B, C, or D. You hear Brian went on a, you know, he he always goes on nightly drives, you know, and just happens to go by the house 12 <laughs> times. You know, right. his, his next uh, uh, alibi. It. But that's going to be interesting to how that and flushes his DNA out. is on a sheet in the house. It just happens to be there, but, you know, go figure. You can use it for Ancestry.com. Uh, <laughs> you can use it, you know, to get your family lineage, but it's not available for serial killers. So, you know, just in case for the brain. But okay. By the way, Chris, uh, yes. uh, uh, Albert Fish was captured because of a cockroach. The oh, true story. What happened is, yes, when the police went to investigate a boarding house where this they wanted to speak to this nice old man that might know something. A cockroach, a very particularly large cockroach, led them into a cabinet where the captain wanted to kill it, to crush it. And when they opened the cabinet, they found stationery that Fish had been taking from someplace to send the letters to the families. It was very unique stationery. And then they were able to trace it to the place where he would go pick it up. And they said, oh, that's the guy that always comes in and asks about our stationery if he could have our stationery but it was a total quirk that wow. that, that that in frustration yeah. Yeah. the police captain wanted to kill that bug and he opened up that compartment that it crawled into and crawled to crush and found the paper so you know wow. it's a, it's amazing how fate you know <laughs> these little quirks <laughs> right play out but uh, yeah. I, you know I, I always think i've got to write a book about fish one day i uh, there's a, there's I always really a way to write about him yeah, I'll add it to the long list. Yeah. Well, call it cockroach. You know, <laughs> well, uh, there's your title. But anyway, I'm not your publicist. Anyway. That said, that okay. said, you could be uh, Chris in a way. Uh, <laughs> you're awesome. Okay, so you're come. You'll come back, of course, of course. with uh, with more stuff coming. And guys and gals, if you've not gotten their books again, and and has many books, so does Gary. But the most recent ones are Killer by Design. And of course, the new evil where um, and your research uh, is going forward. And that's I can't wait to hear some of that stuff as you guys get ready to publish that uh, at some point. Hopefully um, we'll get to hear that. You ready to uh, God bless you all in Maui. Uh, you are in yeah. our prayers, our thoughts and our prayers. Uh, please hit the link again in the chat that's pinned to the chat for Eddie Reyes. 
Uh, he's fighting ALS. Just again, a super great guy. Um, tradition is to give you the last word. So I'm going to pull out and then we're going to go to Hawaii and uh, Dr. Bricado, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to ask Dr. Burgess first and then you. Of course. Uh, and uh, that way my mother would never forgive me. <laughs> okay. okay. Or would yeah. forgive me for yeah. doing we'll, it. We'll, All right. We'll, we'll see you on the next one. So hang on here. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, my last word is let's not forget the victims and what they've gone through and their families. Um, and I, I think we all are thinking of the um, what's going on in Maui and just feel terrible for the families there. That's my word. Gary? Oh, yeah, I, I absolutely echo that. Um, you know, this, um, this thing of uh, offenders outdoing each other to be the most interesting really sickens me. And um, I think, you know, it's very, very sad that people know the names of the offenders and can't name the victims. I mean, that really tells you a lot. Um, and um, I think also what I'll say is that as we talk about these offenders and you find yourself groping for words and kind of reflecting on what one might even term evil, the darkness in people, remember that in the same podcast, we saw Chris um, asking people to reach out and help somebody with ALS, uh, talking about the people who are being affected by the fires in Maui. All of you are such kind people and is such a kind person. The work we do, the work Chris did, you know, in other words, remember that um, the existence of evil kind of proves in a way that there must also be the other end of the spectrum, that there must be goodness. And um, try to concentrate on them, because unfortunately, if, uh, you know, if somebody's walking down the street and they drop a hundred dollars, and you run after them and tap them on the shoulder and say, sir, you dropped a hundred dollars. Let me return it to you. You're not going to be in the newspaper, but if you beat the person over the head and rob them and kill them, you're going to be in the newspaper. So you wind up with a kind of a, um, a heuristic a, a, where you only hear about the terrible stuff and it makes you forget how much goodness there is in the world. So just try to remember that there really are wonderful people in the world that, that, that are filled with love and, and altruism. Uh, and that in the end, this kind of darkness doesn't win. You know, it's a, it, it, you know, it's an old saying that the smallest flame cannot be put out by the largest amount of darkness. And I think there's a great deal of truth to that. Anyway, thank you, everyone. And um, please do remember um, the colleague with ALS and, uh, and the people affected by the fires in Maui. Hard working every day, I'm stressed out 24-7, babe, no, no timeouts Wish we could fly away, you and I Go to our favorite place, oh yeah, yeah Make special memories, together I'll be your company, now and forever Facing a wall Facing away